好，那欢迎大家带到呃，台康台湾二零一九的最后一个 session。那最后一个 session 是我们今天最后一，今年最后一位 keynote Tracy。好，那 Tracy 是 Tracy is a programmer, designer, author, and entrepreneur. In 2010, she told herself, uh, 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 Python to launch her first startup, which led to the book Hello Web App. A book teaching introductory jungle web app development. Today, she is going to bring us the talk, the different paths we take as programmers. Let's give a big, big applause to welcome Tracy. Does this work? Can you? Are they working? Ah. <laughs> Okay. Hello, thank you for having me. I wanted to start out with a story. I speak at a lot of conferences, and uh, about three or so years ago, I was in a conference, I was in the audience, and I was sitting behind um, two men in the audience. And these two men in the audience were, um, it was a DevOps conference, so it wasn't something that was particularly Python related. And I can overhear these two guys in the audience talking about Django. And I perked up because I was looking to make friends and I got really excited to see someone else in this audience talking about Django. And I wanted to like, you know, say like, hello, I'm Tracy, I wrote this book. But before I could, you know, say hello and introduce myself, one of the guys, said this. He said to his friend, I wish they would stop teaching Django because, because it teaches people to be bad programmers. And I just slunk back. I didn't talk to him anymore. <laughs> I, felt, I felt very awkward and I didn't want to come say hello because I am primarily, I, I work primarily with Django, the Python framework, and I immediately felt like he was telling me that I was a bad programmer. And it's funny, because it, it kind of, it started a uh, thought process in me and started me investigating, you know, what it means when someone says, oh, this person is a bad programmer and this person is a good programmer and this person fits a stereotype and this person doesn't. And it led me to investigate and research kind of the paths that people take as becoming programmers and how that path isn't just from A to B, that people don't follow a, a certain, certain one path, but that as programmers and Python programmers, we come into the language from so many different directions, and we use it in so many different ways. And we become you know, back-end programmers, or we become typographers, or we become designers, or we become entrepreneurs or startup founders. And there's so many things you can do with Python and that when you think in those black and white terms that you, know, you can't do something because is good or is bad or Django is, is bad for, for education, that's kind of um, a, bad, a bad idea in this industry. And that's kind of where this, this presentation came into play. So to understand how I think about this, I want to start out a little bit with my journey into programming because my journey is a little atypical. Um, I kind of took a roundabout path in order to get to, to where I am today as an author of a book on Django. This is Hello Web App. Oh, it's very bright. Uh, this is Hello Web App. And Hello Web App is a, a, a book that I self-published teaching people to use Django to build web apps um, not necessarily become a programmer, I say to, to build web apps because it's helping people launch their first web apps rather than learning the, the programming skills to say become a backend developer. Um, so it's kind of a more narrow niche. And since then I, I've released other books. I have actually quite a, a few of these books um, to give away. So if you, after the presentation you can come down and get one. Um, but this is my book on beginner design. So, like Hello Web App is a book on teaching people how to build their first web app. This is teaching people though to design their first web app. And the other thing I work on right now is building, is writing uh, kind of like little print, print zines, um, little like guides on command line and, and Git and other introductory computer uh, topics. 
So I have these to give away as well, but FYI, this is free. So if you want to go to my website, which is hellowebbooks.com, I'll have it up later. You can download and print at home and it's completely free. The other things I've done in this, this Django Python world, the thing I'm kind of um, known for as well, is building a web app called Wedding Lovely. So I worked on Wedding Lovely for about seven years, and it was built for the North American style of getting weddings, helping people walk through the process of planning and, and working with, um, with businesses for their wedding. Uh, and in this journey, it was, it's, this is how I taught myself programming. I was in Silicon Valley in California. I launched this web app. I went through the 500 Startups Accelerator. I, gained, I raised money. It was over about seven or so years, but it wasn't a runaway success, and I actually shut it down last year. But it taught me so much about working with Python and Django, and it's kind of something I got well known for. So I'm not working full time on my books or on Wedding Lovely anymore. I'm actually working at a company called Tiny Seed, um, which is kind of the things that I've learned as a programmer tie directly into my work at Tiny Seed, which is an accelerator uh, for businesses. It's a remote year-long accelerator for businesses, for people who are launching their own business. And even though I'm not primarily a programmer anymore, the skills that I learned with Python, with programming, with building web apps, with being an entrepreneur has directly impacted the work that I do at Tiny Seed. I've had a really, really wonderful career so far. I have, I have launching these books and working on this web app and traveling and speaking at conferences. It's been such a wonderful journey and it's such a fulfilling career. But I almost didn't get here because of what had happened when I was in university. And this idea of programming that some people have as a straight line, as someone who jumps into programming and becomes you know, follows along a singular path and becomes a certain kind of programmer, this type of thinking in university almost stopped me from being a programmer today in the ways that I use Python. I had the perfect background for computer science, for programming, and I'm, I'm 35. I, I started out working with websites when it looked like this, when it was just pure HTML. Uh, this is in the 90s, in early 2000s, and in high school, this is when websites started becoming a thing and, and pure HTML, and I taught myself how to build websites, and when I was, you know, 14, 15, or 16, I made my way through school by building webs, like when a teacher would say, uh, write me a paper or a report on this topic, I would just build a website instead. And then the teachers, because this was so new, websites were kind of a, like a whole new, new thing at that time, the teacher would have their mind blown and they would give me an instant A because it's like, oh, you build a website, oh. And it's like, I did so much little work as compared to a full paper. I loved working at computers. I've had a computer since I was maybe four years old because of family members who worked in computers. And I thought at that time, I was like, I love computers, I love websites, I love building it, I love being on the computer, so I'm gonna go to university for computer science. I ended up getting into this university in California, it's called Cal Poly, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And in terms of the United States, Cal Poly in terms of, for computer science is one of the best universities, at least for like the West Coast, um, for computer science. And I was very lucky to get into this program. And day one, hour one, of being in university, I had my very first class, which happened to be the fundamentals of computer science. And I walked in there, like, you know, excited to be in university and excited about learning this and becoming, you know, learning programming and doing all these things that I, I thought that I loved. And not 10 minutes later in this class, my face turned into this. I was so overwhelmed. And the teacher was talking things like hardware and servers and all these things. And I was someone who loved being on the computer, but I primarily worked with websites. I was completely uh, out of my element. And I walked up to the teacher afterwards and I, I said, like, because everyone else in the class seemed like they knew what they were, they were doing. They're just nodding. And yes, yes, yes. And I'm like, what? No, no, I don't understand. 
And I talked to the professor afterwards, and I was like, am I in the wrong class? Like, is this not the beginner class for computer science? And he says, oh, just it, it, hold on, things will get better. One of the things about my courses in university is that this was before Python became a prominent programming language for, for education. So we were learning Java. And I'm not sure if you have experience with Java. I think, as a beginner, Java is much harder to learn than Python. And it was a very difficult language for me to learn coming from, you know, from markup language, from HTML, to trying to work with Java. Especially because I was working with things that I couldn't see. I was primarily working in the command line. And I managed to pass that initial class, and I went into my second class, and things were getting a little bit better for me. This is when we were working with, um, with GUIs and, and visual interfaces, where you, you, know, you press a button, the button does something, and then I finally started figuring it out. I'm like, this is what I'm used to. As someone who works with websites and HTML, I'm used to having, like, figuring out how things are going to look. And so, you know, my experience in university was started out pretty low and started picking up in this, this second course. But my third course, this is, this is the classes I take, there are three courses in one year, um, in quarters. The third course primarily dealt with theory. So there was nothing visual, there was nothing, um, nothing for me to see or this idea of you pressing a button and causing that button to do something. We did a lot of things with, the, with what's going on underneath, you know, working with sorting methods. And like one of my, my biggest papers that, that quarter was, was reverse engineering sorting methods and writing it like how they work and, and the, the speed that they take compared to the other, the other, um, uh, other sorting methods. And this is something that I am personally not interested in and I'm not good at. I'm not good at the theory. And I really struggled in this class. And the, um, one of the projects, another project, not the sorting project, had a rubric where it said, if you finish this part of the project, it's worth this much. You finish this part of the project, it's worth this much. And of course, as a struggling student, I decided to spend all my time on the things that are worth the most. So when I turned my project in and I received my grade, the professor had switched the rubric. He had changed where, how things are worth, and I realized I could have had a higher grade. So I did what any student would do, as I went to the professor and I, told, I asked him to use the rubric that he had given at the outset. So this is a very reasonable request. But the problem was is that the professor, uh, I sent an email asking him to change my grade, and he responded saying he would use that rubric. But then the professor spent, wrote me an essay to tell me how lazy I was. He told me how it was obvious that I wasn't trying, that I was, you know, wasn't right for this class, that I wasn't right for computer science because I was obviously not studying and I was not applying myself. And just on and on, talking about what a terrible student I was. And for me, I was someone who struggled with the theory and I was going, doing tutoring and I was taking help and trying to, trying to wrap my brain around this. And there's this professor who told me that he did not believe in me and I was not cut out for computer science. And it just, I just couldn't handle it. I, to have an authority figure just tell me that, that um, it wasn't, this wasn't for me and I was like, okay, I guess I agree. Computer science, programming, I guess I'm, I'm bad at it and it's not something I will do. So I, I did a complete 180 and I went to an art, I got an art degree instead which is completely different than programming. I didn't want to do anything with the computer. I was so hurt from this professor just telling me he didn't believe in me that I just decided I was going to become an artist or a graphic designer. And uh, I wanted to do package design and, and design wine labels. And I was done, absolutely done with, with working on computers. Now, as it happens, this is, you know, 15 or so years ago, uh, I ended up graduating university and I kind of fell back into computers as I, as I got a job uh, doing front-end development for a local startup just down the street from my university. It's a very classic story in California. It was literally, literally in a garage and we just all worked together on folding tables to build this startup. And I did all the front-end HTML and CSS and design for this company. And the funny thing is, is that front-end development usually includes JavaScript which is not Java, but I was so scared of Java from that experience 
The mere fact that there were curly braces in JavaScript meant that at this job, I refused to use JavaScript. So I had another person in, the com in my team that would take care of it for me. But I wasn't programming, and I had no intention of becoming a programmer, and I thought I was a bad programmer. I thought that the computer science and programming was not something that fits with the way I learned or the different path that I was on. And thankfully, came along Python. Ta-da! <laughs> because I was in California, where there's lots of entrepreneurs and people who were building their own startups, I got the urge to build my own startup as well. And because, because I thought I hated programming and I thought I was a terrible programmer, I did the thing where I said, oh, I will become, I will be the person with the ideas. And I'll hire someone or a partner with someone who's the programmer to build those ideas for me. It's very Silicon Valley. And so I, I wrote this blog post saying that this, this idea of something I wanted to build and wanted to find someone to work with me on it. So the thing is, when I was, I went through this whole process of finding a co-founder and working with this co-founder and things didn't work out and it kind of turned out really awfully and I thought about trying to find another co-founder and I reached this moment where I realized that if I wanted to build, if I actually truly wanted to build this idea I had, I would have to look at my experience with programming and I'd have to reevaluate whether I wanted to try, try again. And thankfully, Python exists, it was in Java, and Django existed. So Django was perfect for me. As someone who wanted to build something and wanted to use these frameworks um, and wanted to use something that did a lot of things in the background for me. You know, it's, it took care of building the admin side. It took care of, um, you know, setting up query sets for me and allowing me to work with the database and, and abstracting all these ideas away. So as someone who was terrified of programming, Django allowed me to build this idea, this thing I had in mind for, as a startup without being a true programmer at that time. So I built this initial website using Django and I, I started sharing the process of building this website. And this is where my, that startup, Wedding Lovely, kind of started. Um, because as I built this, I built, built this first website, and then I thought to myself, oh, I need to build, uh, I need to figure out how to do payments. So I went out and I learned how to work with PayPal and Stripe, and I learned more. I learned more about programming. I started learning, learning by doing, which incidentally is actually the, the motto of my university, is learn by doing, and here I am teaching myself programming as I was building this web app. And the, the wedding lovely grew to be pretty, to pretty large. Like I said, I, I shut it down last December. But through the process of building this web app, taught me pro, uh, Python programming. And I realized during this process is that, you know, education for computer science, at least at Cal Poly, was kind of assuming that the person who's coming in has a certain way of thinking and has certain ideas of what they want to do. And I had a completely different idea of what I wanted to do with Python programming. And university education didn't fit this mold. So this is the building wedding lovely. That's, I started thinking about how I could change education, or I started thinking about what resources I wish existed when I was teaching myself Python and Django, and that's what started, that's why I wrote Hello Web App. You know, I took that process and I thought, okay, I'm gonna build this book that doesn't assume any programming experience, that it's aimed at people who think visually, and they want to see the web app as it's being built, and maybe they know HTML and CSS, and they know how websites work, maybe they don't know what views and URL, URL confs and all those things are, and I'm just gonna, I'm also going to abstract that away and just lean on, on Django. And the idea is that someone can pick up Hello Web App, learn just enough Django to build something, and introduces them just enough to Python that they feel comfortable learning and, and moving forward with Python in that way. And now I also want to go back to that professor and just take my book and wave in his face. Because his words, his not believing in me, or at least not even telling me that there is different things to do in the industry. I, as, as a professor, I, I feel very strongly that it's up to him to, to 
introduce me to other paths, to tell me that, okay, this is what you could learn, this is why we're doing this. And he didn't, he just told me to leave. That programming wasn't for me, and that I was not a programmer, and it almost derailed the entire career that I have today. So this is the problem I've been thinking about, is viewing pro programming as a straight line of progression. When you see tutorials saying, for Python in general, they don't have any other context in there, they say Python for tutorial, beginner, intermediate, advanced. You know, when you go to conferences, and the same thing, a lot of conferences will often say, you know, this session is beginner, this session is advanced, this session is intermediate. But we all know that there are so many different things that you can do within programming. And you can do in Python, you become, you can work, you can be a dev, you can work with DevOps, you can work with the front end, you can work building web apps, you can use it to, to do algorithms, you can use it for all these different, these different things in this industry. And that these, these straight categories of just beginner, intermediate, advanced in Python as a whole and programming as a whole is not um, doing our industry any good. I, I see this everywhere. I, <laughs> This is like, when I go to conferences, like I go to a lot of Python conferences, and often um, the co conference registration will ask me to put on my badge, maybe, um, what, what is my Python experience? And this is, I think, for Python Ireland, and I was doing the keynote there, and I was feeling very bashful as a, as a keynoter, because I feel like if you're gonna be keynoting a Python conference, they want you to say expert. But for me, as someone who works with Django, I don't write algorithms, I build web apps, I build things that people use, but I don't, there's a lot of things in Python that I'm not an expert in. And it felt kind of embarrassing for me to say I'm a, say, beginner intermediate Python programmer when I'm there to give a keynote. That was Python Ireland. The same thing was happening at EuroPython, where they said uh, Python power, and you can put that on your badge for everyone to see. And I did not feel comfortable saying five stars, so I put myself as three and just walked around feeling, feeling a little bashful about it. So university degrees, these badges, and these buckets are looking at programming as a straight line where the beginner programmer knows some things, and knows a set of things, the intermediate programmer knows a set of things, and the advanced programmer knows a set of things. And you move along these categories, run one to another to another. But programming is more like this, where you can, there's different things you can do within programming, there's different places you can enter programming, there's pl different places you can end up. There's a typical path that kind of runs down the middle, but there's so many different things that you can do within it. People can enter programming from many areas, they can depart in many areas, maybe they'll return, maybe they won't. So as an educator, and I think a lot of you, everyone here should be an educator. As you meet other people who are doing Python or you're mentoring other people in the industry, this makes education so much harder. You know, when you try to, you know, education is easiest when you do assume that beginner, intermediate, advanced path. And it's harder when you have to, to uh, you know, think about the different ways that people can use these things and the different kind of backgrounds and the different ideas and the different paths you can take within the, within the programming world. You know, and as someone who writes books and works on tutorials, you know, trying to accept that I don't know where the person who comes to my tutorial, where they're from, what their education is, what their background is. Maybe they're com they have a computer science degree and they understand you know, some of these advanced co concepts and theory and whatnot, but maybe they don't. Maybe they're like me, who came into Python programming from a different area and a different path. So there's this idea, this, um, this no true programmer, uh, I would say fallacy, that's used a lot, that's talked about a lot in programming. And it was kind of referenced in, I don't know if you know XKCD. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the, the top line is, you know, real programmers use Emacs. You know, real programmers use Vim. You know, real programmers use this. You know, and you might hear this a lot in the programming world, you know, real programmers do Python. Real programmers don't do Python anymore. They do, jo um, they do uh, JavaScript or, you know, React or whatnot. This is referencing a fallacy. It's called the no true Scotsman's fallacy, saying, you know, you don't fit 
as a member in this community unless you fit all the requirements. And we can reference that as a no true programmer fallacy. You know, when you say no true programmer does this or no true programmer does that. You know, true programmers use Vim. You know, you're not a real programmer unless you use Nano or something like that. And these kind of, this way of thinking is like saying there is only two kinds of people in the world, those who can swim and those who can't. It's too binary. So what happens when we start embracing the different paths that people can come into programming? There's a lot of benefits, but one of the big benefits that's been studied is, if, is diversity within programming. You know, if you look at the demand for software developers, we all know this, the demand for software developers has been growing year over year over year as tech has been growing. So this study says that the demand for software developers is expected to grow by 17% between 2014 and 2024. And when computer science kind of came onto the scene, in the 1984-1985 academic years, the year that I was born, women accounted for 37% of all computer science undergraduate degrees, or students. You know, and when we move on to modern times, 2010, the amount of women in these computer science programs drastically dropped. So computer science's industry in 1984 was still a very new industry, but as time has moved on, we have solidified the idea of what a computer science education looks like and what a computer scientist does. And as we've done that, we have narrowed the path that people can be on, and that has led directly to less diversity within computer science education. You know, and this has led from education into working as, you know, in the field. You know, furthermore, the percentage of women working in computer science-related professions has steadily declined since the 1990s, dropping from 35 to 25% in the last 15 years. But when we look at the education, we look at the beginning start of these paths, and we, start, we take that narrowness that we have started establishing, we open it up, look at things like this. The University of California at Berkeley experienced a revolution in inter introductory computer science classes. They changed the course from the introduction to symbolic programming, just the name, to they renamed it to the beauty and the joy of computing. And when they did that, women in the class outnumbered men. So if you look at the beauty and the joy, excuse me, the, if you look at the introduction to symbolic computing, you look at this title, the title is, it feels very narrow. It feels like something that's putting you on a narrow path of symbolic computing, and that means a certain small thing within the industry. It feels like a very narrow path. But when you have this introductory computer science class and you rename it to something that is more broad, Something that says the beauty and the joy of computing that gives you this feeling of the, all the different things you can do with computers and kind of be excited about all the beautiful things that we can do. Then diversity increased. And this, this, one, this study just references women. But you can feel that this allows people from different backgrounds and, and different thought processes and different genders to feel more comfortable joining a class like this because they can see all the different possibilities and all the different places they can go. So when I look at my own education in university, my professor was very much in the, the do it, you can do it or you can't do it path. You know, that he was, you know, saying that anyone who's a programmer needs to know this theory, otherwise they're just gonna fail. And I, you know, I, use Python and I use programming in a different way. And I, I feel, again, I, I feel like my career has been very successful. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited and, and interested in getting, uh, open up these paths for people in education. I've talked a lot about education and the start of this journey. Um, and the, I want to talk a little bit about what happens kind of at the end because the wonderful thing about Python is that not everyone becomes a back-end programmer. Not everyone, say, wants to join Facebook or Google or some of these tech companies as a programmer. Python is used in so many different areas. Python for science. There's so many different ways to use Python in science. And one of the things as a designer I really love is that Python is used in scripting for typography. 
So the, pro the programs that we use to create the fonts will accept Python scripts. So there's a lot of de designers out there that are using Python in order to create the fonts that we use. And I think this is super fascinating because these are the people who are using Python for their world, but the education in these, like, teaching this aren't assuming this is the endpoint. And that's, to go back to my book, this is one of the things that I, I've deliberately tried to work on, where I tried to not assume an endpoint. I tried to, to assume that there is many different places that you can go once you have this knowledge. You know, just like there's no right way of becoming a programmer, there's no right way of learning programming. You know, the, those two guys at that conference quite a long time ago, you know, when they said that no one should be taught Django because it teaches them to be bad programmers, are just assuming the right way and the wrong way of programming. They're assuming that everyone who jumps into programming becomes a bad programmer because they're using those skills, again, at, say, Google. And they're not envisioning someone using Django to write books, to be an educator, to, to build web apps, to be an entrepreneur. So with the, you know, all the different ways of learning Python and all the different frameworks that are part of Python, you could look, if you have this black and white thinking like these two guys, you can look at the, you can visualize the pool of beginners. Uh, kind of like, you know, we had a certain set of beginners before and it was smaller and that pool has got, grown larger over time. And if you have that black and white thinking, you can think to yourself like, oh, there's good programming, there's, there's programmers and they're not, and now there's more bad programmers because that, that piece of the pie has increased. But when you embrace a different path of programming, the different things that people can do within Python, you can embrace the fact that there's, there's not just more engineers out there, but there's, different, there's more scientists, more documentarians, people working on the content and documentation for, their, for, um, for projects. There's more people working on startups there's more people who are building web apps and they're building the tools that we use. And this is what I was doing with, with Hello Web App. Instead of just assuming, you know, writing the book and assuming that people are going to be using it for one purpose, I wrote the book in order to assume that they can be using it for many purposes. And this is something that I've gotten uh, some measure of um, anger and then criticism about. Uh, a few years ago, I, I did a, um, I was, I didn't end up doing this, but I, I thought about doing a course to teach people, like a video course. Instead of just having a book, I would teach people online about how to use my book. And so I had this survey, and people responded to my survey, and most people had very nice things to say. But there are some people who came to my survey just to let me know that I am not allowed to act like an authority, because he, that person is, is visualizing me as not an advanced programmer. I don't have the five stars of programming like that badge had. I'm not an expert programmer. And they have this idea that the only way that you can educate someone in Python or with programming is to be an expert. And again, I do not feel like I am a, I feel like I'm a beginner intermediate person. And yet I'm writing books and I'm building courses. And this person decided just to shove the knife in a little bit more by telling me that my book was ugly as well. <laughs> so, hurts my feelings. So what can we do better? You know, like I said, one of the best things we, can, we, we have in Python is, is how widely it's used in other fields. So Python is not just for backend developers. It's used, like I said, for designers and typography and science and all these different areas. And, you know, our educational resources have increased and there's new frameworks like Flask and Django and these other ways of learning. And, you know, you can still go through university level educations and come in these tech careers. But what can we do better? Knowing that, you know, this black and white thinking is not doing our industry any good and that we need to embrace the fact that the, the idea of diversity in thinking. So going back to that one true programmer myth, you know, obviously reject that idea. Don't, you know, try to be open about the fact that maybe you don't like Django. Maybe you don't think Django worked for you or worked for what you're working on, but it's worked out for a lot of other people. You know, with the uh, advent, with the, with the internet, 
And there's so many different ways of learning and how to learn in depth and so many resources online. You know, there's so many different like uh, boot camps and, and frameworks and things to learn. You know, boot camps, like online resources like Lambda, um, Treehouse, Pluralsight, Udemy. So you don't just have to have a computer science, you know, go into university for computer science, you can learn programming skills in Python and whatnot using these online resources. And the nice thing is that these online resources assume, like they give some people who feel like they're on different paths, these people who don't feel like they fit the normal mold of a programmer to learn in different ways. The problem is, is that, um, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So these alternate ways, of pro alternate ways of learning have promoted diversity because it accepts more types of people and more types of backgrounds. And these resources are used by everyone. Because you might note, two out of three developers nowadays are self-taught, which is really awesome. But you can argue that three out of three developers here, everywhere, are self-taught, but only one third of them actually have a degree in computer science. I'd be very surprised if there is someone in this audience who hasn't used an online resource to further their knowledge, whether it's Stack Overflow or a blog or a tutorial or documentation. So what I was saying before is that there's some problems with this, though, is that this idea of a single line of education, the single line of programming, and that line usually is assumed by jobs to start by getting a degree not by teaching yourself by you to uh, program any of these skills from online resources. So there's a study that kind of went into this. It's um, titled, The Barriers Faced by Coding Bootcamp Servants, or uh, Students. And in a nutshell, it, show, it, it talks about the fact that while there are graduates who successfully found a job after going through one of these online coding boot camps, in general, tech companies are assuming a, they want to have, they want to see a tech degree from a university. So even though these, these people who are in these, these, who go through these boot camps, um, have a, they have a harder time to find a job. These students who go through boot camps or these alternate ways of learning are faced with stereotypes of what a real programmer is. You know, this goes back to that one true programmer, that real programmers have degrees. And the certificates that they gain from these boot camps are not perceived as high value as a university degree. There's tons of tech jobs out there that's, that state that they only interview candidates who have degrees. And that contracting or freelance work is not seen as valuable as a full-time job. Now, if you worked as a programmer, I think you you'll re realize that you know, people I've mentored jump into their first job and they find out that all the education just goes out the window and they spend all their time on Stack Overflow or learning new things um, anyways. And this makes me sad because you know, we all know that, that learning a job is very crucial and there are a lot of things you learn in university a lot aren't used when you're in a real job. And a lot of it's just like learning how to teach yourself while on that job. But because of these, these barriers that are faced by coding boot camp, uh, students, they aren't able to find a job at all. You know, there was a few instances in this study where these, these folks went through the program or they quit the program or quit afterwards because they weren't able to find something for them. And there's quotes from people who said that even after six months of being at a real job, if they found a job and they're at that job, even after six months, they didn't feel like a real programmer simply because they didn't have a degree. You know, and again, embracing this idea of, of there's not just, you know, real programmers, there's not just back-end programmers, not just programmers who work at Google, you know, that someone who can be a real programmer can also be someone who works, you know, in the front-end, and they happen to use Python for, like, you know, and Django and, um, for their front-end development, or maybe they're working on documentation or whatnot. You know, we need more than just these back-end engineers. We need all these people in tech and they see if only to find jobs. And it's too bad that most of these jobs assume that the only real way of becoming a programmer is to have a degree. The other thing to do is to embrace the mediocre programmer. And this was coined by my friend Jacob Kaplan Moss, 
I did a keynote at PyCon US in 2015. And I don't know if you know Jacob, he's one of the founders, he's one of the creators of Django. And he says that he is, you know, he is a mediocre programmer. He, I think he would agree with me as someone coming into EuroPython and these other conferences, um, and they ask you, what is your, what is your Python power? He wouldn't give himself five stars. I think that I actually, now I remember, I don't think Guido gave himself four out of five, which is kind of funny. Jacob says, the myth of the genius programmer is extremely dangerous. On the one hand, it sets the entry threshold excessively high, scaring a lot of would-be programmers away. On the other hand, it also haunts those that are already programmers because it means that if you don't rock at programming, then basically you suck. So Jacob here, you know, I appreciate him talking about this because this is, again, ties into this one true path of programming. And if you feel like you have diverged from the path at any moment, you might not feel like you are a real programmer. Or you might feel like other people who are not in the same path are real programmers. So if you embrace the idea that not all programmers have the same skills, or maybe not everyone's on the same path, or maybe we'll never, none of us will be rock star programmers, our, our industry as a whole will be better. Another thing we can improve is to add more specificity at conferences, events, courses, education when it comes to the complexity of material. Now, I've already mentioned this about beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So what if instead of just saying those three categories, which kind of assumes that one single path of programming, what if we added an extra idea of what the different paths are. So maybe it's beginner plus deployment. If you're talking about a course at a, at a um, conference, maybe it's beginner web apps. Maybe it's in data science. So when you're, again, I'm gonna use, use conferences as an example. When you're talking about um, sessions at a conference, you know, most conferences in the world do beginner and immediate advance, but if you indicate this actual subject material there, people who feel intermediate as a web developer, but maybe a beginner in algorithms, can find the right places for them because they don't fit, you know, no one fits into just beginner, intermediate, and advanced. The next thing to do, and the biggest thing, is probably mentorship. Because the more beginners and people who are, who are in this industry have other people to talk to, and knowing that the stereotype of the, the one true programmer doesn't fit anyone, if you can mentor someone who's a beginner and let them know your experiences and your path and how you got around things, because no one, I think, is, is, you know, follows it exactly, you'll help other people get into this industry. And as a whole, our diversity will increase. And I feel very passionate that we need more tutorials and guides aimed at niches. And that's, again, where I, I am with Hello Web App. My, my book is specifically how to build web apps with Django, and that's very much a niche. What we need are guides like programming for engineers, but also programming for artists, programming for writers, programming for people who want to write to build a startup. So more blog posts, more videos on YouTube, more uh, print guides, more everything in education to take these, like, these different paths, these different beginning points where people might be on, and build more educative, um, educative materials for them. And as a whole, I think more people are going to feel excited and interested in joining Python and using it in the ways that they, they end up doing. In general, even if you feel like a beginner, and again, people always accuse me of being a beginner, and yet, yet I've written a book and I'm up here. Even if you feel like a beginner, you can teach. You can be on stage, you can, you can write these courses, you can write these blog posts. So don't let yourself, if you don't feel like you're an awesome, amazing programmer, maybe you think that you have nothing to say. Don't, don't think you can't uh, teach as well. And I argue, that someone who doesn't feel like they're super advanced, your voice is more needed because it helps more people to know about like, the, the struggles you're going through that might have been forgotten as you become more of an advanced programmer. So in conclusion, the Python community, 
The power in this Python community lies within the diversity of the different ideas and the different mindsets of the people that join our industry in this ecosystem. You know, that knowing that we can use Python and we can use programming and computers to empower people to learn technology and um, learn something faster and allow them to try different things and join something they love. This is the, one of the best things about being a programmer. That we can use all these, these skills and working on the computers and use it in so many different ways in different places in this world. You know, the beginners that we teach and the people who are joining programming just now are going to be the leaders of the future, whether they're going to be in, you know, working in startups or working at the big tech companies, or maybe they're, they're building the web apps and the open source projects and the things that we use today. They're going to be our future, the future leaders. And the more diversity and the more thought we can put into where people are and what they're doing and accept that there's more uh, different levels of thinking, the healthiness of this ecosystem will improve. So I hope this presentation has, has uh, helped raise some questions for you and started a thought process. And, um, and I hope to keep this discussion going. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Tracy's uh, excellent presentation. I don't have a computer science degree. I majored in science, but yeah. <laughs> now I'm using Django for data visualization systems. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so is our chairman. He doesn't have a computer science degree, yeah. too. I believe there are many people down there, they are Django developers, or they don't have a computer science degree. So uh, I believe there are people, they may have questions you want, want to ask Tracy. So people who want to ask questions, please raise your hands. I also have, um, just before oh. we get started, I also have books up here. Um, I have some books for you. Can so, so feel free to come up here afterwards and uh, grab one. I believe the questions have already projected to the... Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay, so the first one, how do you think about algorithm questions in those iconic tech companies? Um, I feel like I'm a bad person to answer this one because that's, that is not the path I'm on and I've never done one of those questions myself. I specifically have avoided working at tech companies knowing that the things that I am interested in don't lead me down that path and I'm terrified, absolutely terrified of those algorithms questions because I know that I will never ever be able to respond to, to answer them which is too bad because I think that I could be an asset to a lot of these tech companies in the skills that I've learned in Python, but I would never ever make it past these initial algorithm questions, the whiteboarding and whatnot. Um, so in a nutshell, I can't speak broadly about it other than my own specific experience saying that, you know, I feel like I've achieved a lot in this industry, but I would never be able to work at those companies. And at this point, I've just accepted that which is one reason why I've always worked at, built my own projects, built my own startups, or um, have worked at small companies where I'm not primarily an engineer. Uh, I think there's a lot of, lot of talk online about improving the interview process um, at these tech companies that to allow, you know, for different thoughts of ways of thinking that will allow more people to get through these interview processes even if they're just like me and they're terrified of algorithms. Um, so in general, like, how does it impact learning motivation, job hunting preparation? I think if you don't feel like you're in that path, it's going to be very bad. And I don't have a lot of answers for that, other than you know, hoping that things will start changing. Um, and I guess in general, what I say is, it, to those people, I would mentor and counsel them to um, uh, look at the different things they can do in the industry and, and know that there's different jobs out there. Uh, next question is, it's a good response. I agree. I don't know what the SCH is. I'm not sure if that's a typo. Something. Oh, okay. <laughs> Saying something is not good programming. Agree is not as important as I think. Well, I think that's the second, com the second question is entirely what I was talking about here. As saying that degrees are not necessarily the same, the only thing that's industry as a programmer. Um, again, I don't have a good response because this is something that's going on in this industry right now and that hopefully things are improving. 
uh, but that there's still these people out there who have this thought, this way of thinking of good programmers versus not, or there's you know one way of doing things and one way to not. Um, so, uh, what's a good response? I mean, just when you letting people know that there's other things you can do as a programmer. If you feel like responding to them, because sometimes it's not worth responding to those kind of questions, uh, letting them know the different things you can do with programming and the different things you can do as a Python programmer, um, or in general, I think is a, is a good counter that you know there's many things you can do and you don't have to have all the skills. Uh, thoughts on Lambda School? Lambda School seems to be doing really good things. I haven't investigated them in depth because they're pretty new, and I haven't been working on that in general, but um, I've heard good things. I, I put them up there, but I can't say authoritatively like, what my thoughts are because I haven't spent a lot of time um, investigating them. And the second last question, given what you know today, any advice for beginners, how would you change your programming learnings path? This is one reason why I like to give this talk. Um, and I, I've given it at a few different venues. In general, is I want, when I talk to beginners, and I tell the story about being in university and having that, that horrible professor, you know, and how I quit. I find that the, a lot of beginners, I find a lot of people who empathize with me. I found a lot of people who have quit university and whatnot, done the same thing. And just knowing that there's someone out there, you know, like me, that have, has forged a career in Python without having a degree and, and going through this, um, that in terms of advice, it's, it's the same thing. It's like that, that's different things you can do in this industry. There's different places you can go and different things you can do with, and just to have a keep open mind. And if one resource doesn't work for you as a beginner, if say you tried using Flask and you found Flask was, was too, uh, you needed more, more things included, you know, try something else, try Django. You know, just try to be, you know, keep trying different resources because not one resource will work for everybody. I think, oh, at the top. Education, learning programming, better paid. For sure, I don't understand that question. I don't know if there's any more. I think there is one more question from okay. Paul. Representing female programmers. I hear that female programmers who feel frustrating to be computational class in, in college, I've heard that so much everywhere. I've, I've given this talk in Canada and in Europe, and it's not unique. It's happened everywhere. It's one of the reasons, again, why I like to give this talk and tell the story because it's, it's happening all over the world. And a lot of women, I think, drop out of university because these computational classes don't necessarily fit for them. Um, so I'm hoping to lead the charge. Uh, I like how Paul is the only one who's not an honest. <laughs> uh, am I writing another book? If so, what about? I am not writing another book because I got a full-time job at this company. Um, but I am continuing to work on these zines as much as possible. So these are the two things I've done recently. Uh, so this, they're both introductory. I'm working on these like, um, introductory guides and they're illustrated. And one of the reasons why I'm doing them and illustrating them is because I'm hoping that people who want to learn Git or if they want to learn computer, um, the command line, you know, some people might be intimidated by using online tutorials, and I thought, okay, if something is in paper, and it's illustrated, and it looks really um, friendly, it might get more people into computers. So that's the things I'm working on right now, and it kind of ties into the different paths of programming. Because, you know, some people work very well from a book, or university, or, um, like, typical resources online, you know, but maybe someone wants to see something that has a funny illustration in the front. And whatever I can do to bring more people into programming, I'm going to work on it. So these are the things I'm working on right now, is these, these um, little booklets. I think I'm good. All right, come up here and ask me more questions. Um, and uh, uh, thank you so much again for having me.